<clears throat> four o'clock CET. So I think we should start, should we? All set, then let me kick it off. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are on the globe. Um, welcome to day two of Collapse Fear. And this session, we are going to talk about what's coming in Nomad Web. My name is Thomas Ampel, and I'm the director at HCL Product Management, responsible for HCL Nomad and Domino. Together with me on stage is my colleague, Bob Silken. Can you just say hello, Bob, and wave your hand? Hello, everybody. Glad to be here. I am on the development team for Nomad for Web and represent some of the squad, one of the squads of the three that we are managing to help bring this new exciting thing to you. Wonderful. Yeah. And as you can see, um, I'm going to uh, say hello to you from your wonderful country of Germany. And um, before we actually go into the technical part of the session, let me just mention a few items, a few details about the logistics. We would like to answer your questions um, at the end of this session, but uh, your microphones are muted. So if there is any session that uh, any question that you have, please use the chat capability of Zoom to post the question to the moderators um, and to the host of this meeting. So we'll get back to this after the show. All right, then let's get started. Of course, one slide cannot be missed out. That's our legal slide. This session is going to talk about uh, the future vision, uh, something that is going to happen. And as you all know, um, things can change. So please be aware of that. All right, um, in this summer, this year, we've launched Domino V12. You all have seen that. And with that, we've unleashed our new product, Nomad for Web Browsers. This latest addition to our product portfolio finally provides the freedom that you all were looking for. So HCL Nomad for web browsers removes the need for installing a Notes client and re reduces the complexity and the total cost of ownership. So you can go to a zero footprint application deployment model and move all your existing applications to a web browser. And as you all know, Nomad also runs perfectly fine on smartphones and tablets with iOS or Android operating systems. So we're really proud to having released Nomad for web browsers this year after several years of development. So your question, of course, is what's, what's in for you? And clearly, developers will understand that by using Nomad for web browsers, you can finally leverage the power of Domino to run them, to run Domino apps in your browser on mobile or on your desktop, just without any modification. Uh, administrators out there will be quite happy because there is no need to install a Notes client anymore. Gone are the days of planning software rollouts onto thousands of distributed workstations. Um, and well, Nomad for web browsers, once deployed in your organization, it just needs a web browser. So there is no plugin needed. Um, if there is no need to install a Notes client, that also means that there is no need to upgrade, to run upgrade projects for your Notes clients. And of course, management will be happy because this functionality is provided to you as part of your license. And it's available in the CCB v12 license that you already have. So how did we make this happen? I'm going to provide you with a little bit of a background and then peeking into some of the features that you were all waiting for. Um, the classic approach to application development, as we've done it for a number of years, is to like, write source code in the preferred language of choice. In this case, the Notes client that you all were using is written in C or C++. And then it's, um, the source code runs through a compiler. And after some packaging, what you get is the Notes client or the client for application access. I mean, this is what it used to work like for a number of years. But um, you all noticed that there was quite some evolution taking place in the web browser technology. So this chart here shows um, the different technologies that were introduced in web browsers in the past decade or actually two decades. And if you're old enough, you remember Netscape Navigator here down uh, to the left, um, which certainly was a milestone. But when you look at this, this colorful chart, you'll see there are a number of uh, lines that 
uh, spanning this diagram, but it's really getting busy at the very end. Each line stands for a technology that was introduced. And as you can see, when it's getting busy uh, here at the end, that really is uh, the evolution of browsers and thereby browsers are really the city center of applications these days. Two technologies have emerged in the last couple of years that are really, really interesting for our use case. And those are WebAssembly and uh, WebGL. Uh, so down, down there, I think, yeah, WebGL is down there. And let me just quickly explain what this is. WebAssembly is basically assembler running in the browser. Like a, it's a low level portable format, binary format. Um, that web browsers can just execute natively. It is kind of what Java, JavaScript promised, but never delivered. Um, it's a very fast way of running code natively in the browser. And um, that, like I said, the standard is quite new. Um, it was introduced in 2015. And just recently, like end of 2019, it was declared to be a standard um, by the W3C Consortium, the World Wide Web Consortium. Um, so WebAssembly is a standard alongside with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. What you need to take away from this slide is WebAssembly run, runs in a browser and just does not require any additional install. So your browser engine is providing you with the capability to run WebAssembly. Of course, um, if you still run on Netscape Navigator, that technology may not be available, so you need to be on a current browser. The other technology is quite interesting as well, called WebGL, the Web Graphics Library. Um, it is a, it's a JavaScript API for rendering uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional graphics in a browser. And that's interesting because we need to be able to draw lines, to draw like frames um, in a very efficient way in order to provide with provide you with a fast and efficient user interface. Um, those of you who have been playing computer games in the past, you may remember there was a standard or is a standard called uh, OpenGL and WebGL is kind of the, the web version of it. So with these two technologies um, in mind, Let's take a look at the technology again. Um, what we can do with that is we can take the existing source code, um, the same source code that um, we used for the Nodes client, and we can run it through a different compiler. In this case, it's called emscripten, and that will provide us with a web assembly module, module or in short, WASM module. Enriching this with a little bit of JavaScript, it provides an HTML page that you can open up in your browser. In short, what it does, you take your browser and it just runs your application within that web browser context. Now this, like I said, is really interesting for the context of taking the complex applications that you had built in the last three decades and bringing them unmodified to a web browser. So um, as a guidance, I'm sure you all have a smartphone or a tablet of some sort out there. And I mentioned before that HCL Nomad already exists for smartphones and tablets. So if you haven't installed Nomad on your smartphone yet, this is your chance by scanning the QR code for the operating system that your device is using. These QR codes here will uh, bring you to the, will redirect you to the app store of that platform. Now, on a desktop, there the story is a slightly different one because like I said, on the desktop, there is no need to install anything. All you require is an operating system with a supported browser. And as of today, the browsers that we're supporting with Nomad Web is Chrome, Firefox, and Edge. Safari here is grayed out. It's not supported yet. There is a technical, um, technical issue that Apple is working on. And maybe Bob, you can say a few things uh, later on in the Q&A section. But I mean, takeaway is um, if you're using any of the three major browsers out there, you're good to go. And you could uh, technically just get started with Nomad Web. Um, we have to take a look at the network side of things on like how you get your browser to access your Domino server. Let's do that quickly. So a typical 
deployment of a domino environment usually looks like this. You have your domino domain on the right hand side with a domino server, one or many domino servers, um, and with an ID vault deployed. And then you have nodes clients or HCAA clients. And since you have just installed Nomad on your mobile device, you can use either or to directly connect to your domino server using port 1352. And that's quite okay if you are within your corporate network or if your firewall administrator is okay to open up port 1352. But in case of a browser, that's a way different story because browsers do not talk over, do not talk the NRPC protocol. So what we need here is a new component. It's called the Nomad server. And that Nomad server is actually there to translate between the different protocols. Um, it's the NRPC protocol on the right-hand side, and it's uh, at the SSL TLS port 443, meaning uh, HTML, like on the left side. <clears throat> so in order to get that Nomad server in place, um, just some background here, what you need is um, you need, of course, uh, proper DNS configuration. So you need to have a DNS domain that your browsers can connect to. The Nomad server, once it ins it's installed, um, provides an admin user interface. That admin user interface can either be located on the Nomad server, or you can run it as, a, as an admin client over port 9555 or uh, 9559. It also needs a relational database which could be MySQL, MSSQL, or whatever. Um, but please be prepared for uh, getting that up to speed. It also needs to authenticate your end users. And in that case, uh, this would be an LDAP connection. So a Domino customer would, of course, just run the Domino LDAP task on a Domino server. But it could technically be any other, uh, any other server as well. And of course, your Nomad server needs to be able to be reached from the internet. So it needs to have a proper SSL certificate. It needs to have a proper DNS name. And that uh, certificate also needs to be available to the Nomad server. Yeah, and with that, you need the Nomad web static resources, which is actually the files which browsers will open once they connect. It, uh, probably sounds um, technical, probably sounds a bit complicated, but it, in fact, it isn't. It just takes a couple of minutes to get everything up and running. And we'll get back to this um, in a few minutes. All right. Yeah, like I said, we've launched Nomad for web browsers in May this year, but there also has been another uh, version released just in September. Version 101 was just released the other day, and it provides a couple of features that we would like to uh, provide you an overview with. So one improvement we did in the 101 release is that we extended our language support. The 1.0 version uh, was English only, but in version 101, we are adding 13 more languages to the stack to make it really a true internationalized product. Now, don't worry, you don't have to decide which language you are going to install because um, this is completely seamless to end users. So with a Nomad web server deployed, what you can do is to switch the language on the client side. And I've recorded this little video just to show you how easy that is. So here I am um, in my browser. I have um, opened up Nomad, but my browser is configured for content to be provided in English. What I'm going to do is I'm just switching to my browser settings and here, I can choose a different language, for instance, Japanese, and add this to the list of content languages at the top. And once I refresh the page, the entire client will switch to a different language. So compared to um, other software where you have to install language specific versions, like these languages come out of the box. Unfortunately, um, Dear viewers out there in Japan, I don't understand any Japanese, so I don't know what this client is uh, saying here, but I hope that you get the point that switching languages is really easier than ever. Another uh, interesting feature that we added because of your request was to make the uh, login experience a bit 
smoother. Um, when, when you authenticate to a Nomad server, we had the prompt, the login prompt on the left side. And then there was a second login prompt um, that appeared when you authenticated against a node's ID. And that kind of seemed to be redundant. So in this version, we are introducing um, a first yeah, preview mode for running a federated authentication. So that means the second login prompt no longer appears. And I think you would like to see that live. So at this point in time, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Bob, who is going to give you a live demo of what else is interesting to be aware of. Bob, are you ready? I am ready. Then let me switch the stack by stopping sharing over here mm -hmm. and you can take over. So thank you very much. I have a few things to show you today, including some stuff that was in 101 and some new stuff that is 102. But of course, we'll start with logging in, which includes the federated login that Thomas just mentioned. In this case, I'm going to a server that is configured for SAML login. This is a key cloak server. This is just what we use for our development. This could be other SAML based servers if you wanted to. So we will just log in. And then what you are really looking for is the lack of that notes ID prompt. The setup steps are the same as they were in 100 and 101. It's just that you won't have that notes ID set up stuff in there. So like Thomas said earlier, this is relatively easy to do from the browser side. It's just downloading the files that it needs into the browser's local cache so that it can run and then it will start up and run. Hmm. We'll probably take quite a bit of bandwidth now with our video streams. So there are status updates as it goes. So this is checking for the additional files in case I need some, um, such as the language files. If I were to switch language, it would download the additional files that it needs at this step. And now it is connecting to my server. It has looked up my person ID and it quickly went by there and extracted the ID. And that is the point where you would have seen the notes ID prompt before because we would have needed that to secure the notes ID. But now using the federated login, we no longer need to do that. It used DSSO credentials and was able to log in. Also near the end of that, hopefully you saw that it mentioned that the Pan Agenda Marvel client was in there in the last few steps of the setup. And that is there in 101. There is a session that follows ours that goes into more detail on that. So I'm not going to say more about that other than the fact that it was there. So now that we're logged in and we're running, this is clean. So I don't have any applications here like Thomas showed you in his recent applications, but I can always go and open an application. And there are various ways to do that. When we start, we have these, this extra button down here. We have this button up here in the bar. I can also go to the menu, which has open application. And we also have many of the keyboard shortcuts that you're used to. So I could hit control O if I was on a Windows machine or whatever here to open an application. So if I go to open an application, we'll go and we will open up the Domino backup database because maybe Thomas forgot and went onto my server and deleted my demo database that I had set up before. So oh my God, <laughs> it's happened. So of course, Hopefully people are familiar with the Domino backup setup. This is the backup task that runs and creates backups and allows us to restore them as needed. And so these are all the databases that are on our test and demo server. And of course we have toolbar actions where you can do things like collapse them all like I did there, which of course you can also see that there are tool tips that you would expect from your previous notes client experience. So I could go back and I can say, oh, Here's my toy store database. And I was like, oh, is that the right database? Maybe it's not. Let me go ahead and open that. So I can't open that. We are a regular functioning client. So I get all of my cross cert and ECL type pop-ups. So we'll go ahead and create that. And you can see that 
oh, I am running the database. And if I wanted to do this, here's the ECL that I wanted to point out. So I could go ahead and answer these. And I can see, okay, yes, this is really what I want. So if I go back to here, I can either do it from here and click restore, or when I'm over here on this one, I can click restore. They do the same thing. So if I want to create a restore record, then I need, or a job, then I need to do various things. So I could potentially change what state I want to put this in. So I could pick with my mouse and click. I can also type. So if I type the first letter being a D, you'll see that it jumped down to deleted. I could use that. If I hit the D again, it goes to draft and that kind of stuff. So there are a bunch of keyboard navigation features like that that are embedded in the dialogues now that are very useful and handy. I'm going to leave this as a draft for now. We have many different controls that are available, such as a date and time picker. So here's the date picker. So I need to pick a date for the backup that I want to restore. And you can see here's the time picker, and this will support 24-hour formats or the 12 hour formats, depending on how your browser settings are set. And you can also change the time zone if you want. Let's say I wanna be in Hawaii where it's nice at the beach instead, but I'm not really. And you'll see these buttons here also automatically set the time to the current time. And so those buttons also work here on this form and that kind of thing. We have the drop down to bring up which of the backups. So I have two backups, which we'll see in a bit. So I could pick which one I wanted to back up from and that kind of thing. We have the checkbox controls. We have things. If I was to type in something that was invalid here, as soon as I tried to switch fields, it does have the field validation that you expect. So it's telling me that I did not enter a valid time or date there. So if I delete that, I can fill in using the button and that kind of stuff. And then there are the other fields that are on here as you would expect. For various places, we also have the context menus. So if we needed to, we can use these as appropriate to copy and paste or insert other things, depending on the field that we were in. So if I go ahead and just forget and I try and close the tab, you see, we'll get the prompt to say, it's, you know, are you used to it? Do I wanna save my changes? I'm like, oh, I really do want to. So yes, yeah, save my changes. So then if I go look in my jobs, you will see that here is the job that I just created. So we can see that it's here and we could run it and we could do those kinds of things there. If I go back and look at the log, so I run, there've been two different backups that have been run on this server and they were run relatively close together. But if I open them up, you will notice that we have the backup logs and it has attachments which are supported. You will also notice that at this point, we don't, we have the actions menu which is specific to the view that we we're looking at. But if I were to pick the attachment, you can see that now the attachment menu pops up. So we are context sensitive based on what is selected as you would expect. So I could save the attachment there. Of course, there's also the context menu if I were to click on it and do that kind of stuff. So there are multiple things like that. Also, I could mark it for pruning. And this gives me the prompt and the confirm. And you can see that the status changed of the icon in here and that kind of stuff. And I could actually run that too. And it will run. And it should take just a few seconds. As usual, you can click on the, the bar here to do that. And also click the function F9. Those keys all work and everything else is like that. So that's just an example of a real world database that I could use and would potentially need to run and be allowed me to get the stuff done. And potentially I can do that at any point too. So if I wasn't sitting at my notes client, I could do that. If I had access to a web browser or when I was on vacation for some reason, I could get to it and do that kind of stuff. So this just shows you the power of being able to run the applications that you already have in the web browser. We just identified a new business case. So admins can manage their servers while they are at the beach on Hawaii. Correct. So. Make sure you get that approved first before you go to Hawaii, but hopefully that will be approved. Um, so let's open up another database. So if we go to the server, again, you can type in here. So if I type in demo, you can see that it has jumped down to the demo folder and I can pick the demo folder. And for this case, we'll open up the classic discussion database that many of you have 
known to love over the years. And there are many things that we can do in here. So of course, we can create a new topic. So we'll just call this demo for collab sphere. We can pick the categories. You notice we have added checkboxes in 101. This used to just be a list. Now you can see that there are the checkboxes in there. So in addition to the coloration, you can also see that the checkboxes are there. You can still type in other keywords as you need to, and they will show up. In our rich text edit fields, we have many different ways to do many different things. So for example, if I want to change the red text to be red, I have the context menu, that works. I can also use the text menu up here to get to other effects, including the color. So we can change that one to red. We can change this one to green. There's also the color picker. So we can come in and we can pick the color there. We can pick the different fonts. So this is another thing that is coming in 102 is the support of additional fonts. In 101, we only had the default sans serif and everything was that font. And now we have the three basic font families. So we have the monospace, sans serif, and the serif. So we'll do that. There's also the keyboard shortcuts. So if I wanted to change this to italics, I can just hit the keyboard shortcuts. You can see it also changed the button bar to have the italics set when I did that. And so all of those things are there. We'll also go ahead and mark this one private. So of course we're trying to be a secure platform. So we wanna honor all the ACLs and flag markings and reader fields and stuff on your documents. Um, let me go ahead and make this blue before I forget. Okay, so we can save that document at that point. Like I mentioned earlier, we do have more font support coming in 102, but of course it's not there completely yet, but we can also copy and paste things now. So we can maintain the text. So if we do that and go back to our demo one that we are creating, we can come over here and you can see that we can either paste directly. We can also paste as plain text, which should then the blue be in the blue in italics, which it is because that was the context that we were in at the time. So we have those things. We have the ability to view other kind of content. So it's not just text. So here's an example where we can see that there is an inline image. And we can also run Lotus Script and JavaScript. So picklist seems to be a particularly popular function to run. So we can show that here we have different pick lists that we've set up. Here's the view for the database. So you can see here's the document that we're working on and that kind of stuff. But it could be other views. It could be your contacts or it could be the names. And this one actually has the EC ECL check. And you can see that the names are there. We can also look up all the different test users that we have for Nomad and you can double click. So we support the double clicks in many places. You can also pick the buttons, that kind of thing. You can pick the details dialogue for users. So you can see that we've got the nested dialogue supported and you can see those, that kind of thing. We also have JavaScript. So here's the, just a simple JavaScript alert. We can have one that does the date. And we can also have one that pops up a goodbye message and then closes the document. So now you'll see that the document has disappeared as you would expect. We also have multiple ways to handle links. So we have the, the copy and paste there of the link itself. And of course, if you do a uh, paste this plain text, you get the classic underlying information to what is there. We can also do oh, sorry, the copy as a table. And so if we paste that in here, we'll see there's that kind of table. But if we go back to the different databases, and we select this one as a table. You'll also notice that we can paste it as a table, but the table is sensitive to the application that it is coming from. So it has the proper columns and everything else. It's not just a hard-coded table and that kind of 
things that you could have. But the other thing that you can do is you can see up here in the URL, or hopefully you can see that without the Zoom stuff in the way. So everything has this notes link after it afterward. So if I copy and paste that, I can also put that in here. And that can be a link that I can either send an email, now that kind of stuff, or I can just open it directly. So let's say, let me go ahead and save this. And then let's say, so I go to a new tab and I can just paste that in here. So and if I paste that same link in there, it's going to allow, because I'm already running in another tab in the browser, it's gonna force me back to the other tab because I'm already running. So I'm gonna allow it to do that. And then it's gone back and it has opened it up back here. But if I had actually closed, get that out of the way. If I, not that far. It will go ahead and start up and it will go directly to that. The other part that is applicable there is the fact that you can bookmark it. So I could bookmark this page and then I could use it in my regular bookmarks, similar to what I've done here for different parts of the SAML logins. And you can see that it had opened up and it came directly to here. The other part of that is that then we still have like go to parent view and some of the menus that you expect so that it is, it is there. Mm. So there are many ways to get to things. So we have the notes links and we have the bookmarks and the bookmarks are useful for copy and paste and sending in content, but also for bookmarking in your browser itself. As part of being a progressive web application, we can always run also as a progressive web application, which therefore then runs in its own frame like this. And so this one is one that I set up earlier. That's a different user. And one of the things that is improved in 101 and 102 is prior to this point, if you click the login there, it would actually have opened up another tab back here in the regular Chrome browser as a tab. And people were finding that to be really disconcerting as far as it's not in the progressive web application itself. So now instead we open up a progressive web application login window, which at least makes it look like it's part of the progressive web application. We need to have the two contexts. So if you had something in here that was running and you had applications running, we don't want to replace the page because that would lose your context and potentially unsaved data. So that's why there are two of them, but at least it looks like the PWA one now. And to show you that the privacy mark working, you can see that I have the C demo one, which is the third document on the left, but it's the top document on the right because the two on the left are private. So those things are working as expected. If I come back over here to my mail, which I haven't opened yet, so it's not on my recent applications, but it is on my workspace. And this stuff can be controlled by policy or by the pan agenda Marvel client on the setup. But if I go ahead and open up the mail, I will just show you one other new feature besides the fact that we do handle encryption. So this mail has been signed and encrypted when I received it. So that is here but also in the things that we have improved in coming forward is the drag and drop. So I could potentially grab this mail and drag it and put it into a folder and you see the context of what the thing is that I'm dragging and dropping into the folder. And you can see that it goes into the folder. And with that, I would like to turn it back over to Thomas to show you a few more things. Well, thank you, Bob, for this demo. <clears throat> As you've seen, we've we've kind of been using the Domino Backup database to show you the various different controls <clears throat> of Nomad Web and that they are working okay. And you might be interested in finding out if your application will work just fine in Nomad Web. And there is a solution for you. Um, this is our newly announced HCL Digital Solutions Sandbox. Oh, by the way, um, can you just confirm that I'm sharing my screen, Bob? Okay. You are, I see yeah. mm, Our digital solutions sandbox is an environment where we are providing a, hosting environment, a hosted environment for you to try out various products. And one of them being HCL Nomad. 
So what you can do there is you can create an account and by the means of a self-service application, upload your own application, your own templates, and they will be deployed and made available to your account in this environment. So if you ever wanted to give this a try, this is probably the easiest way uh, to get started with Nomad Web to find out if this is just working fine. Um, of course, you are probably also interested in how to deploy this in your environment and of course, there is uh, documentation uh, available for you to get started. But another resource that I would like to point at is our Digital Solutions Academy that was launched earlier this year. The Digital Solutions Academy is a um, resource hosted at HCL that provides a number of uh, technical education material for HCL software, for software of the HCL portfolio. Uh, being like, for instance, free online courses, uh, replays of webinars, and so on. And as you can see, for Nomad, there are already a number of videos out there that help you to get a better understanding of how to deploy Nomad, how to configure it, how to fine tune your applications if you wanted to, how to improve uh, work in mobile, and so on. They are being translated to different languages, so check that site out. It's definitely an interesting uh, start point for you. Now, the session that you are attending is called What's Coming in Nomad Web. So we definitely have to take a look at the roadmap. So quickly uh, looking at the, the timeline here, what uh, Bob just showed is features that you can get in Nomad 101, which we've released in September this year. But there is more features in our pipeline that we are deploying uh, in one of the next releases. Nomad Web is on a so-called quarterly deliverable uh, stream. That means uh, it's releasing a version once per quarter. Uh, in this release, we've started the Marvel client integration work. We also are providing the federated login as a preview feature for you to test out. Um, we've integrated or implemented support for double byte characters, so to say IME support, and of course did a number of performance improvements and bug fixes as you've seen. Um, soon thereafter, we are going to enhance the support for Marvel client and uh, work with Panagenda here to even do a lot more or provide a lot more of the features that the Marvel client provides you on the desktop, but also are going to uh, finalize the Nomad Federated Login support. Uh, other features that we are looking at are, of course, offline replication that you were asking for a long time, and that is about to come. And same is print support and kiosk mode. But again, um, this is an agile roadmap, so uh, please be aware that I'm not going to main, not able to say which version number that is going to be provided in. If you have any specific features that you're looking for, anything that you would like to have, please go to our ideation website by scanning this QR code here and provide the input um, that you want us to realize in one of the next versions. Um, Bob, you already mentioned that uh, details on what the Marvel client integration can do with Nomad Web are being presented in, I think it's tomorrow's session that Christoph Adler is going to host. It's called Nomad for Web Browsers and Marvel Client, a match made in heaven. And I think that's tomorrow at uh, 12 o'clock Eastern time. <clears throat> um, yeah, and what else? We also, of course, are aware of administrators looking for uh, yeah, simplifying the setup experience on the server side. So that is also on our roadmap and improvements are coming. All right, so on the broader scale, you know, Nomad not only is uh, consisting of Nomad web, there also is a mobile uh, version of it, no, HCL Nomad on iOS and Android. And uh, features that you were asking for that have obtained a certain number of votes are for instance, the ability to use handwritten signatures, or so to say, uh, using a, what's it called, a digital pen to sign a document on a smartphone or on a tablet. So this is something we are looking at on the on the mobile side of things, um, as well as, for instance, the capability to scan QR codes. 
Also, call to action here is if you would like to have a specific feature implemented for Nomad iOS, Nomad Android, please scan that QR code, go to our ideation page and let us know which feature you would like to have. Features that we already have developed and will ship in the next mobile version, uh, I just have two of them for you as a, as a small teaser on the next slide. So for instance, Nomad Mobile here, the iOS version in the next release 1017 is going to provide support for improving text input. And what that is, is um, how to explain this. When you, when you are typing text and you see that virtual keyboard, you can long press on the space bar and that will provide a little, how to say, a little joystick, a little, uh, the ability to move the cursor around to a specific space, uh, spot. And um, Nomad on iOS in version 1017 is going to introduce support for that. Good news for people with an iPad, especially for people using an iPad with Nomad uh, and have an external keyboard attached. Because when working in applications, we um, often hear from customers that they would like to do this quick find or what what's called quick search dialog. Um, as a notes user, you remember when you are in a view, you can just start typing anything and it will bring up that quick search dialog. That now also is going to be supported on Nomad Mobile, but it does require an external keyboard to be connected to your iPad. So these are just two things um, that I would like to highlight coming in the next version. On the bigger scale, like I said, we are working on support for handwritten signatures because that really seems to be a big use case out there for because a number of customers would like to, to use this function in their applications. Another improvement that we're looking at is to help administrators identifying the client versions that are being used out there. So today, the person document in the Domino directory is not populated with the client version of Nomad. So that is being fixed in one of the next releases. Nomad Mobile also is on a quarterly deliverable schedule. So you'll see uh, there are new versions coming, Android leading here with uh, one release every, every month. And um, as you can see, the iOS version that I was just talking about is scheduled for November the uh, 16th, there is a typo, sorry for that. We really are interested in the features and functions that you're looking for. Um, we, we listen to what you want to have. And just to give you an idea of things that we have implemented in the, in the last couple of months, this is just a small overview of input that came from our customers, from you, that we have shipped and have provided in our product up to date. So um, let me just take a look at the timeline. I think we have a 45 minute time slot here, but still one or two minutes remaining for questions. So let me just skip over the next slide. And Bob, please help me going through this chat where we have piled up a number of questions. Um, so <clears throat> first of all, thank you for I think listening. I've answered I think I've answered most of them. The most recent question is what user license is needed for the for author or reader ACL? Well, licensing is the same. I mean, the, uh, the client itself leverages the CCB license model and there is a blog post that we can certainly reference, explain, reference explaining which um, license is required for a specific use case. So the type of client doesn't really matter. It's um, yeah, really the use case that matters. We'll, provide a link to the blog post. Can we just go through the various questions? Because um, when a participant posts a question, then this question, I think, is not always visible to anybody. So can you okay. just... Sure. So one question was about whether policies would be there to populate the workspace items or how that would interact with recent applications. And the answer to that one was that the policies do apply to workspace population. We use those internally to HCL, so I'm very familiar with those. And for recent applications, that is more managed by the Marvel client integration. And so that session 
we'll have more details on that. Another question was about the application and document properties dialog, which we do not have, and that is a feature in the backlog. The next question I'll let you handle, Thomas, is so my company's migrating off of the platform, but that's still a two to three year time frame. Would rolling out Nomad be an easier project than upgrading the desktop clients from nine to 12? Hmm, I think we kind of um, self um, answered this question because Nomad for web browsers is something that you will deploy on the server side only. You install the Nomad server and with that you have all the uh, capabilities in place. However, um, if you already have a Nodes client rollout, um, if you have already a Nodes client out there, please check um, what's being done with that Nodes client. I have seen situations where the Nodes client was um, using like local desktop enhancements, local desktop plugins that you would not have on the server side. So um, of course, my recommendation would be to go with Nomad Web, but uh, please let's talk about the details. I think that's the most honest way to say. The next question was, are there any plans for Java support? They use small Java libraries to process photos and other applications. So what about those Java inter integrations? A technical question, I think, which is more on your side then. <laughs> sure. So there, we do not have a job. We're not allowed to run Java inside of the WebAssembly container. So there's no way for us to access anything that's in Java. So that is a non, a non-starter in that aspect. So in the way to think about it probably is mostly that you're basically running the notes basic client without the Java layers on top. So, all right. And then how about spell checker support for text fields on Nomad in particular for iOS? Yeah, we, we have that on the backlog. Um, I don't know if you would like to say something more about the technology behind the scenes, but certainly that's already a request that we've seen from customers and we, we already have that on the backlog. Anything more you want to add? I did not have anything to add to that. Okay. Um, Major what is difference. The, can you, yeah, the differences between Nomad running on the phones or tablets and the web browser. Yeah, I think the main difference is screen estate, screen size. And um, another difference, difference is that um, the native applications uh, for iOS and Android are capable of, of like leveraging the device specific features like the compass, the integrated camera, uh, GPS positioning and so forth. So if you have an iPad or uh, a tablet or a smartphone, iOS or Android, please use the native application for that operating system. And for all the other uh, browsers, for all the other devices, all the other browsers, please use Nomad Web. Okay, I think we are already going past the allowed timeline. So I know there are more questions here. Um, so please, if you would like to talk more, if you want to know more about it, um, ping us by, let me just switch back to the start page. Uh, where it is, over there. My contact details and Bob's details below. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for listening and enjoy all the other great sessions at Collapse Fear. So thank you and bye-bye. <laughs>